Hey guys, Ellen Holman here from the upcoming Matrix 4, Army of One, and Loving Monsters. And I'm here with Ilias on the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to the party, pal! You're my boy, bro! Yo, I did it! I did it! A podcast with interviews of amazing guests from the world of pop culture. Oh, yeah. TV. Nice. Movies. Oh, I love the movies. Comedy and more. From deep inside the man cave, your host, Elias. Helen, welcome to the cave. Thank you for having me. How are you? What's new with you? Well, you know what? I feel like in this uh, in these particular times to, to say something along the lines of, never been better it'd be a little weird <laughs> so i'll just say i'm i'm doing all right <laughs> how, how did the whole quarantine treat you were you still well, you working in any projects yeah you know what i was lucky enough um to skedaddle to berlin with the hubby uh stephen dunleavy um because we finished up matrix over there so they had the, their whole other set of quarantine and um, guidelines and everything. But um, we were in uh, not only Berlin, but a teeny tiny town called Potsdam, which is like, I mean, it, you might as well be living in uh, Beauty and the Beast. It was oh, wow. like you were so far removed from everything. So it was a nice respite for a few months. And then, of course, I'm uh, coming back to Los Angeles and it's like the epicenter <laughs> So I'm not going anywhere for a while. There you go. So yeah, the listeners, you know, they've seen you in, in a lot of projects like Spartacus, Love and Monsters. You have a new movie, Army of One, Matrix 4. You have been busy in the action scene, huh? Yes. You know what? I just have a lot of energy. I, uh, I make the joke that I'm like a border collie. If I'm not constantly doing something, I'll, I'll chew the furniture. So it's, uh, it's, it's certainly something to keep me busy. <laughs> so let's get to know a little bit more about you before we start talking about uh, the new movie. Um, at what age do you have an idea that this is what you wanted to do? You know, it's really funny. Uh, there's so many people who become actors um, as it's it's been their life's goal. I, I however, am not that person. <laughs> I um, uh, was raised by two classical musicians and my father to this day, my God, he's going on 45 years in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Um, so I've been used to seeing him perform on stage my entire life. So I got to see the glitz and glamour of the stage and then the chaos behind the scenes. And it was just a normal part of life. And uh, I was always curious about it. And it wasn't until I was around 19 or so that um, it didn't necessarily fall on my lap, but um, I ran into a, a management firm out in New York City. I was out doing some print work um, uh, there for a couple of years and they're like, Hey, you seem, uh, eccentric enough <laughs> to, to excel in this industry. Have you, uh, ever considered it? I'm like, no. So they gave me a list of classes and that was nearly two decades ago. So I've been doing it ever since. How did you not fall into the music, uh, music world like your parents? You know what? I mean, a lifetime of free lessons wasn't wasn't bad. Uh, I did play I did play the piano. My mother is a, a master pianist, and I did play the violin. My father is a big German guy. He plays the viola, and the viola is uh, a little too big for me when I was a kid. Um, so uh, I did play both, but I just wasn't passionate about it. Um, I was more interested in, I guess, uh, kicking boy shins on the playground. And now I found a way to make a living at it. <laughs> So when you told your parents this is what you wanted to do, like, did they try to talk you out of it? They know better. <laughs> I think <laughs> everyone knows better than to tell me I can't do something. Because if you tell me I can't do something, I see that as a challenge. Immediately see that as a challenge. Like, oh, you don't think I can do that, huh? Watch this. Um, but they are always encouraging. I don't think it's um, what they imagined for me. Um, I, I went to Michigan State University. I was at the Eli Broad Honorary Business College. So I was actually going the uh, business marketing um, and minored in uh, international uh, business in, in German. Um, so that was more the direction I was going. And if anything, um, my, uh, my time in New York City was more like a break from the academics um, and I ended up discovering this industry. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I've done there ever since. So you mentioned you took acting classes. Like how, how did that go in? Uh, how long before you decided to move to LA? 
You know what? Uh, it, only about a year or so. I was in New York. Um, was it a year or two? My God, that city. I mean, one year there is like 10 years anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I took everything from Meisner to Method to Stanislavski, all, all the different methods. Um, and then um, it, it was just something I sort of understood. To me, it's just as important to be left brain as it is right brain in this industry. And I still to this day believe the most talented actors we will never see on screen. Because to be able to repeat your performance, uh, just from a technical standpoint, um, pe- this is what people don't see. They don't see that you're surrounded by hundreds of crew. They don't see all the tape on the ground to show where your marks are for, for uh, uh, making sure that you're in focus. Um, they don't see the eight hours worth of repeating the same damn thing over and over and over and making it new every time. They don't see that. All they see is the few minutes on screen. Um, and that it either takes a genius or a crazy person <laughs> to, to want to do that. So I don't know where I fall in that spectrum, but it's not a normal business. <laughs> it really isn't. So when you moved out to LA and you started auditioning, how did you like fall into like the whole action scene? And is like, was that like your goal at first or is this like what fell in your lap and you pretty much stuck with it? Uh, I've always been pretty uh, uh, keen and staying athletic and um, I, I played all kinds of sports. I was uh, a, a pitcher and first baseman for softball. Uh, I played uh, for soccer. I, I did um relays and a long jump and track. Like I was, I was always highly active, but um, I was uh, uh, one of four. And so I don't, for those of you who are parents um, out there, I'm not yet, I have a, I have a fur baby, but that's about it. Um, mar- the martial arts are not a cheap uh, avenue uh, when you have four kids. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time running outside and like I said, more of the public sports and YMCA and basically running around my siblings. Um, So the martial arts were not something that was openly available to me um, from that standpoint. So, uh, but I, but being athletic always was something that interests, uh, interests me. So I didn't um, actually get into martial arts till I was, I would say in my mid twenties or so. Um, and that's actually uh, what allowed me to um, uh, really hold my own on the show Spartacus. That essentially changed the trajectory of, of my career uh, because I, I didn't have a stunt double on that. It was all uh, my own action thanks to uh, the trust of the creator, Stephen tonight. I was like, hey, Stephen, what do you think about Saxa having reverse script double daggers? He's like, can you do that? I'm like, sure. <laughs> And so I showed him some videos. I'm like, yeah, what do you think of this? And he, uh, he, let, me, he let me go for it. Um, and a lot of times in our industry, whatever you quote unquote break out in, that's, that's what, what people expect to see from you. So I've been uh, taking that baton, proverbial baton and running with it ever since. Mm-hmm. Do you like doing your own stunts? Yes. Uh, it's the kind of thing um, that is so much more challenging <laughs> than, yeah. than to sit back and watch a, a double do it. Um, but it also, especially when you're creating your own content and uh, your own time and money constraints, not having to edit around a double space is certainly uh, more cost effective. And, and also, I just, I just love it. Um, I've, I've been doing jujitsu for quite some time now, as well as, um, judo and, uh, Aikido based fight choreography. So it's, it's just a language that I understand. And to be able to bring that on screen is, um, it's a thrill. It really is a thrill. And I work, uh, quite often with my husband, as I mentioned, Stephen Dunleavy, who is the stunt coordinator for Army of One, but he's also part of the 8711 uh, action design team and their stunt team that's done everything from the John Wick franchise. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the owners of 87, Chad Stahelski, directs the franchise. Um, and they also did Atomic Blonde and Deadpool and uh, my, my all husband's the good stuff. all the good stuff, uh, as well as Matrix. Um, and these, these, this has become my family essentially over the years. I've been training alongside them for so long. So 
Um, especially in Matrix 4, we are able to speak the same language. So uh, they can be like, okay, uh, so instead of Sayuji, let's do like a 180 uh, into a Sayuji. And then from there, you know, like uh, pick her back up, do a Kodageshi. So that like we can, we can, uh, what normally would take much longer um, to, to train somebody, uh, it, it takes a fraction of that time. And also the ability to take what we call wrecks and that's actual, actually hitting the ground, <laughs> which I don't recommend for the longevity of your, <laughs> your bones, <laughs> but that's, that's certainly a skill that takes years to build up. So uh, ask me, ask me in uh, another 10 years. I'll 10 go. years. I, I think yeah. you're still going to want to do it. Some people are just like, I've had other actors that come on the show and they said like, they don't, even, they hate it when they even go on a set and they, well, oh, I could do this stunt. Oh no, we, we want somebody else to do it. And you're like, no, I can do it's, this. Well, it's a liability. It's, a, yeah. I, I can tell you it's, that's why in uh, army of one, I did come in uh, quite late in the game. Um, so I didn't have much say as to, uh, uh, who the crew was or uh, like the story was already uh, solidified, but also um, it was important to me to have the stunt performers who could also act. Um, so that way we didn't have to do the double situation and anyone, I wanted to be ensured that anyone who, who did have action had a background in it. Cause mm -hmm. if all it takes is one tweak or one twist of the ankle or one broken bone and and they're out. And from a yeah. continuity standpoint, that can totally bone you. So you have to be really careful. It's a gamble. So let's talk about Army of One. Like, how exciting was this project for you? Well, it was an absolute blast to a wear so many hats. Um, yeah. I, I was able to be um, one of the producers and a, a massive revisionist on it. Um, and then, uh, from an action design standpoint. My, my uh, husband and I run True Rain Productions and that's basically like what we'll do. We'll come on in and um, uh, design the action and execute it. And we cast all the, uh, all the stunt performers. We did a fantastic job. Uh, we asked a lot of them, <laughs> very limited time, but it was just thrilling to, to really push myself and not only be a performer, which is what I've been used to for so long, but also like during a scene, uh, ask the questions of myself, like, okay, is this gonna match continuity? Okay, uh, so with that light, I think isn't gonna match like what we did in the master and, oh, okay, we need more blood here. Like, so I'm thinking of a thousand different things as well as the performance. Um, so it was, it, it's thrilling. It's really thrilling to me. It tells a little bit about the film, what it's about. So Army One is uh, an action drama that follows uh, a woman, Brenner Baker, yours truly, who's a former army ranger, and she's essentially revenging her husband's untimely demise. So uh, what makes this film different than all the other uh, heavy action dramas is that, as I said before, all the performers are doing their own action, and also you have a female protagonist. Um, and I feel that now more than ever, the glass ceiling is breaking on those type of opportunities. Uh, just at least from my opinion, women have an ability to bring a certain level of heart and empathy to screen that, um, not that men don't have heart and empathy. They absolutely do. I happen to be married to one, <laughs> but uh, you'll see in Army of One, there, there is um, a more potent heartbeat um, than what you would see in like the John Wick series uh, or Taken. Um, yeah. There's there's more of, uh, yeah, there's just more of that uh, aspect. So I watched it last night and uh, it kind of reminded me like those n late 90s action type of movies. Oh yeah, well, it's funny. Stephen Durham, um, the, the main writer who came up with the story and everything, he's like a Rambo fan. <laughs> <laughs> so when I first read it, I'm like, whoa, dude, <laughs> is this the sequel to Rambo? Because if that's not what you want to make, like we need to modernize this a bit. Like even even like the music and uh, I, I uh, had a massive input because I'm like, okay, we can't, you know, rip off Rambo here. That's a little, I'm not signing on to the sequel to Rambo here. Yeah. Um, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of his, his influence, um, which, you know, it's we're not out to win any Oscars. We're out to entertain the hell out of you for 90 minutes. Right. 
So did Steven call you for this part or did you actually have to go on audition? No, I didn't, I didn't audition for this. He, uh, I knew Steven Durham through a mutual friend. Um, and then also the EP, uh, Nico Foster was an executive producer on a Western that I did called Justice years ago. So uh, we knew each other uh, prior. Um, and so he, he called and offered it to me. And then uh, when I read it, I'm like, look, um, we're, my husband and I are used to working on some uh, pretty, pretty fantastic content. Um, if we're going to dive into this lower budget uh, world, allow us to use our resources to elevate the material per se. Because a lot of times these super low budget uh, action dramas can fall into endless tropes and uh, yeah. stereotypes. And this one sure has a few of them, but you certainly will not see this kind of action in a in a uh, you know a mm. super low budget film when you got the script how many times did you read it before you decided that you wanted to do it just once you you just know once. within you'll know within 10 pages if you want to be part yeah. of something i always judge a script by how many um typos there are in it really? <laughs> i'm so i am so unbelievably i don't know if i'd say left-brained but i'm i think very technically and to me, if you have a piece of material that you're, you want me to spend time on, if you can't even spell check your own stuff, I'm not even going to read it. Like, I can't tell you how many scripts I've been sent over the years um, to be apart from production side, uh, a revisionist side. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff I've done ghostwriting on that I haven't got credit for. Mm. Um, and uh, if I see more than a few typos in 10 pages, I won't even read it. I mean, it makes sense. You want to you want to get pulled into it, I guess, in a way. Yeah, because it's like if you want me to care, then you need to care enough right. to to you know to spell check your own shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you mentioned you have like you know uh, mixed martial arts background, and um, you've been in the taking care of yourself for all these years. Like, how do you prepare for this kind of role? Like, what kind of research do you do to play this character? Well, what I thought was really important is that if you're in the military, if you're, whether it's former or currently serving, there is a certain level of training that you go through. Um, yeah. And uh, particularly the Rangers, they have a set regime. Um, and a lot of that is jujitsu based. Uh, actually, one of my um, former professors, Hiron and uh, Henner Gracie, go around training the military in Gracie jujitsu. Um, a lot of it is ground oriented because 80% of, of corals end up on the ground. So you're only just like the UFC, you're only as good as your ground game. Um, mm. It's a good way to and put that, it. Right. Uh, it's, it's true. Um, so we wanted to uh, really make sure that Brenner um, was uh, incorporating a lot of jujitsu, which is what I've, I've spent most of my time doing over the years. Uh, we wanted to bring that to screen. And uh, what I tell a lot of people is that um, what happens many times, especially in the action world, by the time you get the job, it's too late to prepare for it. <laughs> I, uh, what I mean by that is, okay, uh, on the bigger, bigger, bigger budget ones, sometimes you have the luxury of getting weeks, if not months of rehearsals to condition yourself yeah. uh, so that you can survive take after take after take. Um, however, especially the smaller budget or TV even, um, I did a, a pretty good run on NCIS New Orleans for a couple months, which wasn't expected. That was supposed to be a two episode guest. Um, and they ended up killing off the other villain to make me their lead girl for um, two seasons. And if I didn't have the prior conditioning or the knowledge, there's no way I'd be able to learn all that stuff. Um, so, you know, you're only, you're only as good as your worst day and off season, um, is just as, if not more important than, um, than on season. I mean, even as we speak, I'm, I'm done with matrix four, but I'm still sparring a few times a week and I'm still keeping the conditioning up because you never know when that phone's going to ring. You, I was just going to say that. You never know when your phone's going to ring. So was, no. this, uh, was this finished uh, film before the pandemic? Yes. Yes. Thank God. Oh, my God. Because let me tell you, the precautions that film sets have to take is it's, it's a lot. Uh, you're looking at 20% uh, cost increase 
because um, just from the uh, opportunity cost standpoint, you're looking at like, yeah, nearly 20% increase because the amount of time it takes to, to test people, the amount of money it takes. Imagine yeah. you, Matrix, for example, had nearly 400 plus people on their crew and they were testing three to five times a week. Wow. Like who pays for that? Production pays for that. Um, and then uh, like to getting your temperature taken before you go on set and just every, uh, every section of production has its own pod. So every, it's like you have to duplicate everything. Um, so it's a lot. And I think a lot of uh, shows have been compromised because of that. Like an additional 20% can, can take you out of your price point. It can essentially execute your, your uh, you know, your show yeah. in the head. Yeah. Well, yeah. In the, well, in the beginning of it, some shows got renewed and then they got canceled because of this. Yeah. Like glow, for example, like that's just such a shame because that was doing so well, but what people also don't realize um, we finished uh, the San Francisco section. Thank God uh, in February in San Francisco, we, we finished uh, what we had to establish there and that's right before the shutdown, right before everything happened. And then there was a good five, six month gap. So we were supposed to go immediately to Berlin. So this is what the masses uh, or people not in the industry, this is what they don't understand. All of those sets that are built, all of that crew, everybody, you know, some of them get compensated in the meantime, but you still have to pay your overhead. You still have to pay for those warehouses and, and those facilities to store and maintain your props, your, your uh, sets, everything. Like, so productions were hemorrhaging money, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars a month. And I'm sure that, you know, shows like glow were no exception where the producers, you know, they did the math and they're like, look, even if we do engage in full operations here we're never going to be able to break even so it's just not cost effective and it's so unfortunate right. yeah yeah i can see that is there any plans for uh, a sequel well you know what i always tell people uh always uh make sure you have a reasonable denouement to your season finale or your standalone feature. Uh, so you don't take your audience for granted, right? The last thing you want is a cliffhanger. And then all of a sudden, like we were just talking about, there is no sequel. Oh, <laughs> so you I have know. no closure. And as an audience, you just feel so screwed. Um, so yes, there are some Easter eggs in there um, uh, that could lead to a potential sequel, but it is as, it's, as it stands, it is its own, it is its own thing. How can the listeners find the, the movie? So you can find us on Fandango, Amazon, iTunes, uh, Vudu, uh, Google Play, etc. And also, right. I, I constantly post updates. Uh, I constantly post updates on my social media, which is my name uh, for Twitter and Instagram, at Ellen Holman. And then also uh, on, uh, on Facebook, uh, Ellen Holman Official. So I'm, I'm constantly... Um, posting updates and if you scroll down you can see where it's where it's playing and same with love and monsters um love and monsters is streaming everywhere as well so you keep uh we keep talking about somehow we keep bringing matrix four in here and i gotta know how was it being in that kind of world after all these years for the new movie oh it was absolutely extraordinary um like i said to work alongside my favorite stunt team in the world. And also my husband, my husband was um, one of the key riggers on it. He helped design and engineer some of the incredible feats <laughs> that the performers, uh, actors and stunt performers alike were able to, to, to do. Um, so it just, it was one of those surreal life moments yet at the same time, I felt I belonged there. How, how long were you on set for that? Um, it was a couple months in San Francisco and then three months in, uh, in Berlin. And there, but there's a lot of prep. There I was a lot, like just that. a lot of, yeah. So, uh, actual shooting days were quite marginal and compared to the amount of time it took 
to to uh, be able to reach that level um, of of on screen. So uh, once again, that's what people don't see when they see you know ten minutes of film on screen. That's something that can take months and months and months and months, especially if you're shooting a lot of things practically, which is what Lana insisted upon. So it's real helicopters. We're on top of real skyscrapers. Like we're actually doing this shit. <laughs> it was not, it's not like CGI or green screen. Like it is, it's real. Like she actually blew up a street in San Francisco. Like she's on another level. And was it Matrix when between the Matrix Three and now the Matrix Four? A lot of things have changed in the world too. Yes, uh, and I feel like this pays a, a homage to the first one. If if uh, you were to compare it, um, at least in my opinion, this one this one uh, goes back to its roots in a sense, and I think people are really going to be impressed with it. Um, and one thing I can tell you is, uh, it is not meant to be watched on your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how people can watch things on their cell phone. To be honest, no, like, do like, do me a favor, whoever's listening, do not watch Matrix Four on your cell phone. It just, if you can get, depending upon what the world is like, then um, I hope theaters are are still are gonna be around. Um, I know that it's gonna be do, doing a theatrical and an HBO Max release simultaneously in December 2021. Um, who knows what the state of the world will be. Um, but even if you are essentially forced to watch it in your home theater, at least watch it on a TV. <laughs> like right, even in, right. don't even want like on an iPad that won't even do it justice. Like <laughs> this movie is meant to be seen in IMAX. Like this is an incredible, it's like watching, did you ever see Mad Max Fury Road? Yeah. Yeah. That's you gotta another watch one. It with, my... You gotta watch it with the big sound, the screens and the sounds. Oh man, when we went to the premiere, because my husband worked on that for a year in Swakopmund, Namibia, he he basically doubled like half the cast, but he uh, he was part of uh, the stunt team for that as well. And it just, I mean, to be in the theater with the surround sound and the, it was just, it's an experience. Like that's why we make freaking movies it's for an experience it's not to just like kill a few minutes it's for you to feel something whether it's It's, an hour 90 minutes two or you know three hours who who knows it's just it's it's meant to allow you to escape yeah and it's easier to get distracted at home when you watch a movie i have two young kids it's hard to watch movies oh yeah no exactly it's funny because a lot of my friends uh i have a lot of i'm originally from michigan and so many of my friends are, uh, they, they're snowed in. So they have to homeschool a lot of their kids uh, right now. And they're like, we've tried to watch your movie, but it's not, it, this is not a kid-friendly movie, by the way. <laughs> like, this is absolutely not a kid-friendly movie. So they've had to like, they keep having to pause it or it's like their kids are sick or like right. up in the middle of the night as they're trying to watch it. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. I've done that before where I'll pause a movie and I'll get back to it two days and finish watching yeah then you're, then you're just kind of like the experience is diluted and right you know you might as well go back to one <laughs> um any other projects that you got coming out before uh like before the pandemic started that coming out soon yeah i mean like i mentioned before love and monsters with uh michael rooker dylan o'brien and jess henwick and she's also one of my love and monsters uh castmates or matrix four uh castmates so that's a that was a pretty fun coincidence because she's just amazing um uh, so that recently came out um and then yes there's there's quite a number of things i have uh, in development at the moment so given given the whole uh pandemic scenario we'll see <laughs> we'll yeah. see where where we had we end up setting up pre-production well, well it's all it all remains to be seen <laughs> Uh, Ellen, one more time, uh, tell the listeners uh, how they can find you on social media. So you guys feel free to give me a shout out on at Ellen Holman on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And then Ellen Holman official on Facebook. Ellen, this was uh, fun. Thank you for coming on. No, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everybody. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to the Man Cave Chronicles podcast. I finally get my man cave. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the MCC Podcast. And our website, themccpodcast.com. Until next time. Until next time.